now we have questions until they kick us out. By the way, I do want to say, congratulations, this is the first campus that we actually got through that without people. Way to go, Stanford! That's Woo!
Michigan for the Ireland. <laughs> senior majoring in economics. I can't confirm there are a lot of straight black men here. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on the left, um, and I, I imagine you're going to have a lot of questions about race and immigration, but I wanted to push you on a more nuanced sort of set of economic thoughts, right? So I feel that on your side, you talk about free markets a great deal, and I just want to ask you, number one, how do you think that economic nationalism sort of uh, goes alongside sort of this Milton Friedman as you kind of, you all expound sort of sense of uh, free markets, they, they seem to be at contrast with one another. Economic nationalism is not a part of sort of uh, orthodox economic thought. Secondly, and that's only because I think the Stanford College Republicans, they had a table about why socialism is bad or whatever. Yeah. Socialism sucks. Socialism sucks. Socialism sucks. Socialism kills. Yeah. Socialism is the worst idea of the 20th century. Something. Yeah. So we had a debate there as well. And another example, we were talking about property rights and things of that nature. Uh, one of the things that I brought up there is that, according to orthodox economics, if you underutilize sort of resources, land, labor, capital that you have, the government is doing an efficient thing by taking and redistributing those resources. And the question, and the response that I got from them where was essentially, free market's okay so long as it doesn't conflict with sort of the ideals we believe in. And I said, well, that's not really free market thinking. So my question to you is, again, sort of the, the principles that you have, you know, based on free markets, how does econo economic nationalism, how does that coincide with it, in addition to the sense of unused property rights? Okay, so let's go to the second one. I'll kind of volley a question back to you. Do you think, based on pure economics and based on the utilitarian models that we have, that government's really more efficient at using idle and sedentary land, capital, and labor than the market? Well, to answer that, so if you take a uh, specific example of squatters' rights, that's a situation where the government isn't actually doing anything but saying. Give me a specific example of squatters' rights where they're not taking an asset that could be unrivaled. No, what I'm saying is, for instance, if you have squatters' rights and you just let and say that if someone moves into unused property, let's say after six or seven years, I guess depending on what sort of state, which state you're in, you can stay in the house. That's the government just saying, okay, people, do what you're going to do. That's not the government actually going out and seizing the property. So you're you're saying that when it's not owned privately, it's not owned publicly, and it's completely barren and has no. No, no, it's land. owned. No, no, it's owned by the person that decides to squat in it after the period of time because the house well, no, is used. But if, if the land is not owned by anyone, no, it is. It is. That's that's the whole premise. I think squatting is very rural, like Wyoming, Montana, North and South. No, no, but it's a fair example. I'm just I'm just asking. No, I, I know, but so if you talk about, I mean, that, that's you, just you're, taking, you're yeah. taking a piece of private property from someone else and you think they're not quote unquote using it, then you're in a value in position upon the owner of that piece of property. Because they might be storing capital, but behind that might be value on <laughs> they might be using it for something in the future. So I would argue strongly against squatters' rights. Oh, and, and that's just a specific example. No, no, I understand. Yeah. I asked for one. But the broader point is I would make a more nuanced argument for the second part, I'll go back to economic nationalism, that the market is and always will be a better utility to use labor capital and um, land than any other, than the, the government ever could. It's more efficient, it's more widespread. So the market is really, really good at bringing prices down, bringing quality up, and making accessibility go horizontal. We see that in every single vertical. Where the market is allowed to exist. Um, you see the quality of good go up, you see the price go down, and you see more and more people able to have it. So I, I, I don't disagree with no, you. So I'm, saying that's what, yeah. that's, I'm, not, I'm not saying we disagree, I'm saying that's where we come from. So we try to have market-based solutions to basically every problem that we come across, whether it be education, whether it be technology, or finance, how can we incorporate timeless free market principles into pro structural problems that we have? So let's talk about the inner cities. Candace talks about this a lot. The government has a pseudo-monopoly on education right now. Okay, so bad teachers are not, are not allowed to be fired. It costs twenty-four thousand per pupil to educate an individual in Baltimore City Schools. Yet independent studies show that thirteen schools in Baltimore, they could not find one student in those thirteen schools that was proficient in math or reading. That's a failed government monopoly. So we come at that problem. We say, all right, we know markets work. We've seen it work throughout the course of time. With the standard living increase, prices go down. How can we incorporate market-based principles into a government structured problem? So we come and we say school choice, voucher system, allowing parents to be able to have competition in that sort of in that sort of community. Where, by the way, a Catholic school will better educate a student at nine thousand dollars a year, where the government will poorly educate a student at twenty four thousand dollars a year. So but to answer your question, but this is just a question. I think the question is, I'm not so much 
That's everything you said is fine. Competition is, is great. Yeah. My question is: Is would you would you not say that in orthodox economics, the idea that the government takes unused land labor capital and puts it to efficient use that's a part of heterodox economics, and that is an efficient government intervention. The no, idea is a Milton Friedman approach. Where we don't, we don't well, I think you. I, I don't think that Milton Milton Friedman would disagree with what I just said. Well, okay. I would, I would argue that in the, in the confiscation of such property, I would resist government ever intervening okay. against private property, sure. both on principle and on economic practice. Mm -hmm. More on principle, if, if what you're saying is true, and I would yield influence on that, if what you're saying is absolutely totally true that there was an economic model that no Friedman endorsed, which I highly, highly doubt, I think um, should, I think then should, I would say based on principle, 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 the government should not take that piece of property or that asset because I believe firmly in private property. That was a big question. And then economic nationalism too, right? Okay, economic nationalism. I mean, I'm a, we're fierce opponents of economic nationalism. Okay. We are we are big proponents of a more more pro-American sense of economics, where you look at the Trump tax cut, which has been unbelievably successful at creating wealth, creating jobs, bringing capital back to this country. Uh, we have the lowest kind of black unemployment ever recorded, the lowest uh, Hispanic unemployment ever recorded. And as far as trade, uh, the goal should always be open to free markets, which we don't have right now in China. And so, to confirm, you are okay with economic nationalism, so folks. No, I'm not. I, would, I, would, I hate that term because it's a loaded term. I would say that a more pro-American tilt to our economic policy is something to do. You know what I consider pro-American? Low taxes, low regulation, and a competitive, competitive on international scale. That's what I would consider. So you would disagree with subsidizing prices? I, I don't think we should subsidize oil. I don't think we should okay. subsidize refrigerators. I don't think that's that's picking and choosing industries. By the way, we shouldn't subsidize solar panels or electric cars either. Okay. So that, that would be my point. Cool. Um, so it's actually a little bit more on what he said, but it's a slight philosophical twist to it, which is um, most progressives usually think that everything important must be regulated because if it's not, people will take advantage of those resources. Many conservatives think that humans have an inherent capacity towards evil, which is why they usually are a little bit stricter with the behavior in their family unit. So I was wondering, how can we say only that part of those ideas exist or currently, specifically in a place like Silicon Valley, that it's, it's like constant growth, constantly, like all the time? I think you're the first part of the question. So the first part is basically that most progressive things that, most progressive things that um, everything that's important must be regulated, because if it is not, people will take advantage of it. So that's why you have like massive regulations and things that um, intervene in the personal choice that people have. Um, like a second story to your house, depending on your dominant or whatever. But many conservatives think that um, they have many. Uh, many so I asked the second part. Okay, good. So, so the first part um, when everything is regulated, there are people that are taking advantage of it, it's the government. Yeah, and, and so it's a government is taking when everything is regulated, the people that are taking advantage are the government, okay? And that, that hardly impacts the individual, right? So if you have goals, for example, like I don't know if you understand how big our government has gotten. It's, it's so ridiculous that you need a piece of paper to do anything in this country. Yeah, I used to be able to grow up and just have a lemonade stand. Can't do it anymore. You can stand with the government. I don't know if the government can get arrested. Because, you can get arrested if you have a lemonade stand, okay? When I was, um, I think, 12, I made a little fire to do marshmallows. I know, I, I totally understand and I totally agree with, with you guys, but I am just wondering in, especially in like very progressive, left-leaning coastal cities, you know, you have massive growth, maybe because of um, many details that are not right now, but how can you counter the massive growth when you have a lot of people sort of like competing for resources and then the conservative-minded family unit, you know, they think that, um, I mean, you heard the second part. Yeah, I wouldn't make it as binary. I mean, look, so as far as like the Silicon Valley example, I mean, growth, growth is fine. The best way to the best way to distribute resources is not through government planning or centralized control through a market-based type system, whether it be food or water or transportation. And as soon as government gets far too into central planning, things start to get really screwed up. I mean, just look at this state. It's a disaster. It's a total mess. People are leaving the state in record numbers. It's totally completely bankrupt. You misgender someone, I think you go to prison now. It's not a mutual mess. Um, but look, you know, make this, I'll make this distinction. America should look a lot more like Texas and a lot less like California. <laughs> uh, and disagreements, please come to the front. 
please. Do you have a disagreement? Good. I believe I do, if I understand. Okay. I'm glad I didn't make this to the meeting tonight. It's my first meeting. My name's Doug. Hi, Doug. Hi, I am a recovering socialist. I'm a 12 step group, actually, 12 rules for life. Does your organization, is this the one that has the list of professors? Bingo. I'm the first blush, not knowing more about it. It sounds a little McCarthyistic. Can you please explain it? Sure. So, thank goodness perception should not always be reality. Um, the professor watch list has been and continues to be one of our more controversial projects, but it shouldn't be. Um, we started it in November of 2016, a couple of weeks after the election. Uh, mostly because I was getting tips and complaints from our student activists on nearly a thousand campuses across the country about how they were being wrongfully targeted, about how they were being ostracized and silenced in lecture halls across the country. And I started to tell people about it, members of the media, and they kind of discounted it, and I don't think they gave appropriate amount of coverage to what was really happening. And so we took it to the next step. Let's say, well, let's start aggregating this information and use other pre-existing uh, news sources, third-party verified, whether these school newspapers, Huffington Post, MSN.com, of these things that these professors have done and have said. And the difference, I'll make a huge distinction right off the bat. I mean, we're actually showing you our list. McCarthy never actually did any sort of list whatsoever, <laughs> for those of you that are students of history. Second of which, these professors should be thanking us for making their thoughts and ideas that they consider to be so brilliant and public to the entire world. Word for word. <laughs> that is absolutely more as more, right? And, and thank, thankfully, we live in this era of smartphones so to capture something like that. All we're doing is making these professors famous. Their ideas are so amazing and so great yeah. that we want to share them with the world. We're, we're, not, the world. we're not saying fire these professors. We're not. We're not asking for anything to be done. We don't say we're obviously just get fired. We're saying look at these amazing ideas. <laughs> it's, it's not Professor Blackwell's. It's not Professor Hitless. Just and by the way, we've got one here at Stanford. We've got a real view, so you guys can check out. Hi. Uh, so I have a question for Candace. Um, and so I really enjoyed listening to your thoughts about the way that the Democratic Party is kind of taking advantage of Black America. And I was wondering um, to what extent, I guess, the same is true for feminism. Because I've definitely noticed a lot of things in the feminist movement, which I think are very similar, which I think are actively harmful toward women. Um, but on the other hand, there are significant kind of differences between the two populations, right? It's not like you can inherit that. Everyone has a male parent and a female parent. And so I was wondering if you think that issues like that mean that the approach should be different or whether that should affect that in any way. Sorry, I think what issues should be different? Whether the way that we approach, or at least like the solutions to the ways that women are being right. Around. So I I hate modern feminism. <laughs> 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 Um, so my question to you would be, I mean, my, my answer to you 
would be to follow your gut here. There is something extremely wrong with modern feminists to be better than it. And make no question that the idea is only to attack men. This entire movement is actually about men and not women. Bingo. She's right on. What's up, guys? Good to see you guys. Right. First, no, you can laugh. First woman running the CIA, Nikki Haley, who's doing on the radio. Sarah Hunter Sanders, who is the first female press secretary in nearly a decade. Obama didn't have a female press secretary. Um, president Obama has more high ranking women and cabinet officials in the positions of any other president in U.S. history. It's zero to no recognition for it. Women unemployment is at a 40, all-time low. Women entrepreneurship rates are going up. And by the way, modern-day feminism doesn't like to talk about how well women are doing in America right now. Better than men. Much better than men. Much better in every regard. Women are more likely to graduate college. Women are much Less likely to commit suicide. Less likely to go to prison. Forget Kelly. Um, much more likely to start a business. Less likely to commit suicide. Um, much less likely to die in an act of combat. Much more likely to die in an act of a crime. Um, women live a lot longer than men. Their life expectancy is eight years longer than men. Um, so there's a lot of things going in the right direction for women in America, all of which I have no trouble about. But when I look at the International Feminist Women's Society, I see no recognition of any of these amazing women leaders such as Nikki Haley and Sarah Huckabee Sanders and Dina Haskell, or they like not a woman because they're a conservative, or Candace Owens, they don't consider them to be feminist enough. Number two, they don't have any sort of the recognition of the strides that, that women have successfully made over the last 60, 70 years to overcome this victimhood narrative, nor destroy the fake gender rate pay gap, which doesn't exist. Third and finally, you have, uh, did Linda start to speak here yet, or is she going to? Yeah, she did. I mean, she is, I mean, she's a complete and total, so like I gotta be really careful about what I say right now. Um, horrible person. She is, she's despicable, that's the right word. She's a, she's a despicable person because here she is, she complains to be a feminist and stays completely silent on how institutional, theocratic, and Islam is the number one enemy of women's rights across right. the Look at Saudi Arabia. Right. Saudi Arabia. We only need five men to accompany us when we walk down the street. We might be able to take off our burqa for half a second without getting our head chopped off. Yay! Look at our progress. And, and that's what these modern feminists have to promote. They take down someone like Candace Owens, they promote someone like Linda Sarsar. It's absolutely disgusting. Make no mistake. Modern feminists is, is about teaching women that they are, in fact, weaker than men. That's exactly what it is. They dress up in something else. Stay away from it. I'm telling you, it's toxic. Thank you. <laughs> So I agree that illegal immigration is a huge issue, and it seems like a big reason for illegal immigration is people overstaying their visas when they fly here on an airplane. How is building a wall and spending billions of dollars building a wall going to prevent okay, so illegal immigration? <laughs> I love the idea of building a wall. Build the 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 wall. So, the, 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 Not the, the idea is a lot of two things. Saying that we don't have money for a wall, but we have a 4.4 trillion annual budget and we can't find $10 billion to secure the wall, which will save us hundreds of billions of dollars in taxpayer subsidies of illegal immigrants is absolutely incomprehensible to me. Not to mention, an illegal immigrant from Mexico, Nicaragua, Guatemala, or El Salvador is twice as likely to commit a crime versus a natural born citizen. We have 56,000 illegal immigrants 
from Central American countries in our prisons that we are feeding breakfast, lunch, and dinner that should be deported back to their home countries yes, with a receipt for the amount of money and crap that we had to spend on them in legal costs, in judge, judge costs, border patrol apprehension costs, so on and so forth. Make no mistake, if they were really sending their best, Mexico would prevent them from leaving. Right. Okay? So we should build a wall, first and foremost, and then if anyone overstays their visa, they should be deported. That's how you solve that's how you said, solve that issue. And we should have a much more technologically advanced immigration system. And you're right. We should have a pro-legal immigration system. We should open up our legal immigration population and say we want the best from all countries. We want the best from Senegal to Singapore to Hong Kong, Hong Kong to Hungary. And then we should build the wall and have a zero tolerance policy of anyone passing across the southern border. If you care about sex trafficking, 30,000 kids are illegally sex trafficked across the southern border every year. If you care about guns, 2 million guns are, are trafficked across the southern border every year. If you care about opioids, 97% of all the heroin that comes in this country comes across the southern border. If you care about human rights, you want to talk about why women cross the border and when they cross the border? They cross during when they're having their periods because they don't want to get raped. You, you care about decency? Then you secure the border and you stop all this. And finally, if you care about gang crime, MS MS-13, which are animals, by the way, MS-13 animals. They come across the southern border. They are animals. When they come across the southern border, they are happy that the border is porous. We went down there. It was an absolute joke. It was a disaster. But I don't disagree with your analysis. But I will push back when someone says we can't find 10 billion dollars in a 4.4 trillion dollar budget to do a national security issue and also something that will better our country. So. But but do most illegal immigrants illegally cross the border or do they come over via car? So we have about 8 million visa overstays and 13 million people that have crossed the southern border. So total population is 21 million yeah. people. So more across the southern border and then they have anchor babies and they are anchor babies. And they are, yeah, they go on welfare. They, they have a baby, they go on welfare. And then they chain migrate, which is a total mass, total disaster. 80% of them never even go on welfare, so they can't go to welfare. And, and by the way, we're very pro immigration. Right. Legal immigration. Like right. the president said, no wall, the big, beautiful door, fill out the right paperwork, and come in this country. Don't break our laws. Come here and play the big That's right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Hey, I'm. Um, Left of center, so yeah, Welcome. I guess. Welcome. Thank you, uh, Chapman. I'm sophomore studying history, right. and I'm interested in rhetorics of populism, rhetorics of nationalism, etc. And so I've been pretty interested listening to your talk because you begin by saying that it's facts, not feelings, that matter. Um, which, yeah. A anyway, interesting. But <laughs> um, listening to you talk, it seems that your rhetorical strategy is playing into people's emotions. I mean, you have a very angry style. And I'm not, I'm, I have a problem with that. <laughs> um, and it doesn't, it doesn't seem as though you're presenting, you're presenting a long series of different arguments. Um, it almost reminded me of a stand-up show, right? Where you go from bit to bit, which was entertaining. Uh, but I guess my question is, are you talking about, you say facts, not feelings, but do you think that your rhetorical, uh, whatever rhetorical power you have, that it's coming from the feelings that you're creating in your audience? Or do you think it's actually coming from the validity of your arguments? So when you say that our, our facts are creating feelings, is that what we're, you're saying? No, it's, it's just this presentational style you have. That seems to be tapping more into feelings and facts. Right, so I wonder, how do you reconcile that with what you said in the beginning? Well, when we're talking about facts, I don't, I don't really understand what you're saying. You're saying that the facts are making people emotional, and that's the oh. argument. Yeah, I mean, so look, I mean, I hope you, some people laughed and some people thought about issues a little differently, but that's the key thing. If thinking is your, if thinking is the gateway to feelings, then so be it. However, we used a lot of facts. She talked about the lack of single motherhood. We talked about the deterioration of the inner cities. I just rattled off a bunch of facts about the southern border, whether it be crime or drugs or illegal, you know, illegal immigrants coming in this country. Everything we have is a statistical backing and a logical reason behind it. So when we say facts over feelings and you're creating and sculpting public policy, we take a step back and we do critical thinking and reflection based on logical history perspective and good ideas, timeless ideas that can stand the test of time and natural rights and respect for the individual. Now, whether people find that funny or entertaining, we'll be playing into it a little bit. I'm glad you find it entertaining. Yeah, that's good. Because we're packing audience, obviously it's working. Yeah, and, and that's, that's really the thing. It doesn't really matter if your talk is exciting, but if we're saying it's true, by fact, you're not up here talking about our feelings, you're not selling socks over here. I'm, I'm backing, I'm giving you evidence for why I believe what I believe, why we believe all of these things behind us. 
Um, so I, I guess the question is really the audience. You're asking why they're getting excited. Maybe because it's the first time that they're seeing their ideas reflected on campus. Yeah. <laughs> uh, my name's Miriam. I'm a sophomore. Um, my question is about identity politics. Um, I know conservatism and TPU values the individual of all else, but at the same time, um, Candace, you tailor your message specifically to the black community, and TPU kind of taps into that to turn you into a weapon. So, um, how can you? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> how, how can you kind of um, use the, you know, uh, tailor your uh, message to a uh, single community and kind of highlight the importance of that to them without kind of slipping into the identity politics that's, you know, abhorrent on, well, on the left? So, so here is where we find that people have a, a identity politics is, identity is okay. I'm a black and I'm a woman. If I want to go have a party with a bunch of black women and talk about black hair, we're not against that. That's identity. We all want to be human beings. Identity politics is when I get into a room of black people and I say, because you are black, you therefore must do this. I don't do that. You have not heard me say one thing. I don't tell them what to vote for or who to like. I tell them to understand that because you are black, right, they are using your blackness to dictate how you should perform. I'm talking about identity politics and telling them that you do not ever do that and ever accept that <coughs> thing as individuals. Uh, we have no problems with identity. We don't want an anarchist society. We're not saying that you can't be, uh, you know, have interests. As a Spanish person, and, and we, we can't, we're not saying that Jewish people can't be in the stuff that happened in the Holocaust. You, we have that identity should be celebrated. It's okay to be different. The problem is when people tap into those differences and they weaponize it within the political spectrum. I'm not doing that, but I appreciate you using me as a weapon. Um, I, I don't think I have a weapon. But I just want to differentiate identity politics is different from identity. We have no issues with identity. You should celebrate your identity, and that should be okay. Don't let it be hacked people that have more nefarious causes. Uh, anyone in line of disagreement, raise your hand like a fierce disagreement. Anyone? Are we really just all just going to agree with it? A couple of, for those of you that disagree, come to the front, please. We're running short on time. Sorry, question. Megan. You're getting so close. <laughs> Jeff, you're getting so close. Yes, my friend. Quick question. Are we disagreeing with what the speaker has said or with the views of TPUSA? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> And then, then we will get to the yes. Sorry. You, know, you have to ask the question. Yeah, you gotta ask the question in you know, 30 seconds before. So again. Thanks for being here. Hi, Michael Straka, senior at Stanford. Um, I have a disagreement with something you posted on Twitter recently. Oh yeah. You mentioned that uh, one of the topics that would be discussed today is that Donald Trump is the greatest president of the United States. <laughs> That we will see. God bless Donald Trump. Trump is your president. Yeah, I'll tell you exactly what I do. Okay, so my question for you, Charlie, is Mega. does this necessarily imply that Donald Trump is a better president than Kanye West would be were he to be elected? <laughs> 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 You can then update that he was a president and say Kanye West is the greatest president, and Kanye West is not a president. How can you disagree with the statement? Yeah, if he ends up being a great president, he's elected. Uh, I, said, I said Donald Trump will go down as the greatest president of our lifetime. That's what I said. from you were answering another question like a minute ago. You said um, identity is okay, it's okay to be different, celebrate your identity. Um, right here in front of me, there are only two genders. Um, for me, that's someone right. who Biology. feels very strongly that identity is something that's very fluid, I'm just curious what you would say to the fact that identity, you should celebrate it, but also two what genders. would you say to someone who I guess is questioning their identity um, gender-wise? Like how would you then argue that identity I don't, I, don't, I don't argue science. I'm saying that's sex, not gender, but I respectfully disagree. So. Sex and gender are directly related. Come back. Come on. Oh, God. Two genders. 
Hi there. Hey, Joe. Like, again, is, my name is Freddie, uh, local political, I guess you could say, uh, major in political science. And, you know, being a native of Santa Clara County here, San Francisco Bay Area, California, I'm at a crux here. Sometimes I can be a little bit liberal, sometimes I can be a little bit progressive. I'm actually a registered Republican here. I hate the establishment in Sacramento, but at the same time, I want to push you and challenge you a little bit respectfully. I see a sign right over there that says Trump is great. Um, I assume you have many reasons as to why you think Trump is great, and I actually do support some of his policy when it comes to smaller government, freer markets, yada, yada, et cetera, et cetera. But I can't help but notice some inconsistencies with his uh, conservatism, for a lack of better words. Uh, for example, his stance in the Second Amendment and on borders is a little bit different than what you would expect to see from a traditional conservative. For example, Reagan and Bush didn't have these immigration hawkish approach to the borders and things of the sort. And similarly so, when he was sitting down with members of the Senate, including Dianne Feinstein, my senator, yeah. uh, <laughs> <laughs> he actually said something that was very interesting to me. He said that maybe we should raise the age of long gun assault weapons to 21. <laughs> Contrary to the NRA, <laughs> not only that, he said that we should take guns away without due process. So just using those two things as an example, I, I, I want to ask you, is there any flaw in that? Is there any inconsistency with that? Or did I simply misunderstand what the president stance has been on the Second Amendment and borders with tra traditional conservatism? Or maybe a better word would be classical liberalism. That's what I would call myself. I don't like the word conservative or Republican. I actually call myself an independent, independent politico. That's because I'm more of a classic liberal, not a social liberal, but definitely not a progressive. And even saying conservative here in California, which used to be a bastion of conservatism, has a stigma attached to it. So I just want to throw that at you. I know it's a, it's a lot to take in, but what either of you care to? Um, well, look. I mean, if you care, if you care about freedom, you care about Western civilization. Donald Trump's been the most successful president since Ronald Reagan, if not the last hundred years. Not <laughs> not um, as far as the Second Amendment, he one out of eight of all circuit court judges across the country that have five-star ratings in NRA have been appointed and selected and implemented by the president. George Bush couldn't tout that same record. George H. W. Bush certainly didn't tout that record. Uh, President Trump has advanced the ball further in terms of pro-life policy as far as those of us that believe in religious freedom um, in, in significant ways. Uh, Heritage Foundation rated him the most conservative president, most year of a conservative for a president in their history. And as far as borders, I would make, I think Reagan and Bush got the border issue wrong. I don't right. think open borders should be the position of the Republican Party. I think we should have strong borders. I think quick follow up, so would that be classically liberal? Because I know you mentioned the word libertarian here, and open borders is definitely closer to a libertarian ballpark than conservative yeah, one. It's my biggest disagreement with libertarians is open borders. Mm -hmm. Okay. My biggest <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. 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 You're welcome. Hi. I'm Greg. I'm from Lee from Lomo. Um, and I just wanted to say that you used the term the Holocaust earlier, yeah. and um, the Holocaust actually means burnt offering, which is not a great term when you're saying the six billion Jews were murdered, they weren't really offered to God. Um, so I recommend using Hashoa, which means the catastrophe in Hebrew instead. Oh, the patches. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> hashtag, hashtag. Hi, uh, my name is Patash. Uh, I'm from Santa Clara University, and uh, I'm also a legal immigrant. So yeah. Uh, uh, right now, we are going through a trade war with China, which is against the ideology of free markets. And I did read an article on Wall Street Journal that uh, China started the trade war like years ago. But don't you think the better way is uh, to not like? Be engaged in a trade war and tone down China to like not engage in this like don't uh, raise tariffs on American cars and stuff like that instead of Trump trying to like uh, go against the ideology of free markets. I mean, look. So the goal is open and free markets. Tariffs are a tactic against the Chinese negotiation wise to get us there. Um, but I kind of laugh. I mean, we have unbelievable trade imbalance with China. And some people would argue that's a good thing. I wouldn't. Um, this is a $500 billion trade balance. So we threatened $100 billion in total tariffs. 
the Chinese get so upset and said, we are going to retaliate with $5 billion in tariffs. They, they don't buy enough of our stuff. They can't tariff our goods and services. I mean, they, they can't find enough stuff to tariff them. So like a trade war? Yeah, a trade war would be us putting tariffs on their stuff. I mean, but I'm not, I'm not endorsing it, nor am I tolerating it. But look, here's another thing the president doesn't get credit for, which really irritates me, and all these critics and all this, I don't like them. Like, we're about to see the end of the Korean War, folks, because of President Trump. Make no mistake. People were mocking him on January 3rd when he sent out a tweet. He said, I have a bigger button than yours, and I'm not afraid to use it. Yeah, we all laughed. You know what? The intelligence reports at the highest level of CIA will tell you that Kim Jong-un took that unbelievably seriously, was suffering some, from sleep deprivation for months. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. Because he said, that should might be the U.S. president who has the balls to use U.S. force in the Korean Peninsula again. And that is brought into the negotiation table. That's why we're denuclearizing. That's why South and North Korean president are hugging on international TV, and I have to watch on CNN Stormy Daniels. For <laughs> I mean, if Obama was doing this, they would have given him, well, they already gave him a Nobel Peace Prize. We're doing nothing, by the way. By the way, Obama oversaw the, the, the rise of ISIS, wrongly got rid of Gaddafi, let Putin do whatever he wanted, saw worsening tensions with China and Korea, and they called him this great arbiter of peace. Weakest president of our life. <laughs> This is like one of my first like Republican events that I've gone to. Uh, it's been good, you know. I Woo! Mean, a lot of good points. <laughs> All right. I don't agree with that. Conversion. Thing, I mean, it seems like you don't think I have to, which is something I respect. Um, and there's just one thing that uh, I wanted to ask about. That I mean, it hasn't come up, and I can tell by your posters, it's not really the focus of your organization. But um, you say that you support um, facts and not feelings, right? Um, so I was wondering how you reconcile this with Trump's uh, climate policy or environmental policy, because um, this is a pretty significant threat, in my opinion, um, based on the evidence that I've seen and the research that I've seen. What was the threat? Yeah, climate right. change, specifically, and I know it's a politicized term, but I'm just interested to know what you think. We changed it from global warming to this is what the Democrats said in phase one, 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 six. We changed it from global warming to climate change. You know why? Because the scientists are looking into global warming. Right? There was actually no faction that had to back up their arguments to the change to climate change because climate's always changing. Extracting our tax dollars for some Paris food and no actionable plan, and America was losing. So what Trump did, he ripped it up. We got out of it. Paris food. I saw that. Yeah. Um, but those are distinct, like scientific terms. Like climate change, global warming is happening. Like there are curves. Um, well, that from years. Years. There, you can look. You can look at the studies. There is an idea. Let's talk about this. For the rising global temperatures, let me ask you three quick questions. Can you prove humans are contributing to it? Can you prove how long it's been happening and what the causation is? And can you prove that anything we can do can stop it? Can you answer those three questions? I can. Um, so, so the first you question, can prove humans are contributing. Well, I'm just a freshman in college, but uh, <laughs> 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 if I could, <laughs> no one can. The answer to those three questions are well, this is kind of how science works. Yeah, you can. You can prove humans are contributing. <laughs> Using the scientific method. Wait, can I? Can I? Can I? Can I suggest? Can I address you? Oh. You can address me. Oh. Okay. Um, so, <laughs> okay. So, okay. Let's talk after. No, it's simple. We can talk after too. No, but like, uh, here's the question. Here's the three main questions: Is can you prove humans are contributing? Can you prove that what we're going to do is actually going to affect climate, global temperatures, positively or negatively? And then, at what cost? Are we going to completely restructure our carbon-based economy or something that is still having an immense amount of debate, dialogue, and discussion around? Because I'll tell you right now, other countries such as India and China, they are trying to get their hands on as many fossil fuels as possible. Now, if the market wants to go toward um, a carbon-free economy, so be it. The government should not subsidize it, nor should we get in an international pact, as Candace mentioned, which will restrict our economic competitiveness while all of the countries that hate us are going to burn as much coal and as much natural gas as they can get their hands on. That's right. Okay. Well, uh, for the first part of your question, people causing climate change, um, it's kind of a boring explanation. I can tell you not to too many boring things, but uh, for sure, definitely, there's uh, there's a thing called the Seuss effect. You can look it up if you want. Um, basically, yeah, it's the there's certain isotopes of carbon that decay when they're um, 
taken in by plants and then uh, yeah, turned into fossil fuels, so <laughs> underground. So ultimately those isotopes decay when they're burned or released into the atmosphere. Um, the fact that the concentrations of those isotopes are increasing shows that it's almost certainly linked. Can you, can you draw a direct correlation in the scientific method of the aggregation of those isotopes to rise to global temperatures? Well, yeah, of course. Cause More so than sunspots for natural climate activity? I'm just curious that the reason I ask is real climatologists ask these questions and they're still debating them, the ones that are not government funded or highly politicized. Right, where's the money? There is a 99% consensus on So how about the 1% science about democracy? We don't, we don't vote on gravity, we don't vote on Newton's second law. No, no. <laughs> I mean, if you don't want to do the reading, you don't have to. I have. I guarantee you, I'm not sure you much more than you have to answer the question. Is science the one? No, you said 99%. If it's 100% then it's true. 99% is the opinion. That's not, the, I mean, I can debate with you about how science works. How is 99% too many? Seriously. You can't. 99% of the people in this room can believe one thing that doesn't make it true. No, they're scientists. These are scientists that have put their entire work and their entire life on the line. You have three percent. It's ninety-seven. The statistics I do is ninety-seven percent, which is a totally flawed statistic. But let's pretend it's true for a second. That three percent that disagrees and defects. I want to know why they disagree and defect. Absolutely. I want. Yeah, but but the reason is not consensus. If we're able to prove without a shadow of a doubt that there's a direct causation or correlation between fossil fuel activity and rising global temperatures, it will be a hundred percent. Those three percent that are defecting and disagreeing, that's what science is all about. That's yes. why we have a scientific method. That's why they gather and they disagree and they discuss. But you, you came at it from how could I disagree with facts? Yeah, I'll give you a fact that I hasn't think. been proven. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> sorry guys, we have one more question. Sorry. Don't you made it! 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 You Better be good. Fans, Red Coat Black, love it. I love the way you handle yourselves. I wanted to compliment everybody here again. This is an amazing place. I know we, you know, agree and disagree. I have to say I've been to many different things like this, and there's been a lot of yelling. I just want to give props to both sides, whether you agree or not. Um, same to you two. You're doing an amazing job of controlling things and you're keeping it going. I like the little skit you guys got going on. Whether other people like it, I like the setup going on that you had. White privilege is a lie. I agree completely. Trump is great. He is the greatest president ever. Yeah! Kill them all. And to kill them all. Illegal is not a race, okay? Just like I, I'm just saying, bottom line. I ask people, how are you going to protect your children? You're going to use the forks and knives that you're left with? You're in London, yeah. You feel me? So, so I just want to say, just breaking it down, and I heard someone talking about rhetorical arguments. Ethos, pathos, and logos, people. Bottom line, that's the part of an argument. You're going to appeal to people's emotions with facts and data. Your ideological arguments, you can use whatever you want, race, but facts and statistics, they turn me off. I like things like that. So when I, I'm just saying, when I have somebody in front of me who is a well-spoken, articulate woman of color who's standing up for what she believes in and I'm hearing the constant attacks, it really does remind me as, as a Caucasian white male, blonde hair, blue eyed, almost the equivalent. I am deemed a Nazi, I'm a racist, I'm a bigot, I'm everything you can imagine. And it kind of brought me to that question earlier. Are we more racist than we were in the 40s? I don't know, but I can tell you that in the early 2000s, I was not called a bigot, a Nazi, a racist. So true. So, and all the time.